Hello YouTube, it's Exorcizzle. Today I'm starting a new series all about Fatal Frame, one of my favorite video game series ever. I'm sorry, I know that this isn't what I usually do, but it's October and I'm feeling pretty spooky. And this is honestly something that I could go on for, for days and days and days. That's how much I'm passionate about this game and I want to get it out there. I want to get it publicity, even though I only have like 35 subscribers. Whatever. We're going to be talking about the plot of Fatal Frame 2 today. So if you've never played Fatal Frame before, all the games follow a very similar plotline. A very pretty Japanese girl follows her loved ones into a haunted slash in general cursed also Japanese location and gets trapped there until she can find her way out with a camera. Since you find out the story primarily through notes on the ground, not everybody gets all the notes or gets them in the correct order so it can be kind of hard to get it on your first try. It's definitely a strange concept but there is so much folklore and mystery behind these games that I cannot wait to explain everything for you guys. Before you watch this video, I highly recommend you watch Fullpix and Fairno 91's video about the story behind Fatal Frame 1. I'm going to be building a little bit off that video, and this video may be understand if you watch that one first. So before we get into the backstory of the game and the subplots, let's first take a look at the main plot. Spoilers start now. The game opens with Mio and Mayu, the game's main protagonists, around the age of 5 to 8 playing in the forest around the Lost Village. Mayu isn't as fast as Mio, but Mio is a little douche and she won't slow down for her. Mayu ends up falling off the side of the cliff and injuring her knee to the point where she still has a limp around 10 years later. 10 years later, in 1988, when the game takes place, Mio and Mayu are back in their old stomping grounds playing around by the river for nostalgia's sake because it's going to be destroyed by a new dam soon. While Mio is briefly distracted by the guilt from the accident, Mayu runs after a crimson butterfly. Mio realizes maybe a minute or two later that her sister is missing and chases after her into the heavily wooded area. Mayu, who keeps flickering in between herself and a girl in a white kimono, leads Mio deeper and deeper into the forest, eventually making their way to the Lost Village, Minakami Village, or All Gods Village. The village of many names! The village is a local legend said to be trapped in endless darkness and those who find it are spirited away, never returning to our realm. Once the twins pass the Tori Gate, the path out of the village closes behind them and they can no longer find their way out. I don't entirely understand how this works, but I like to think about it like being on the inside of a ball. You can go around forever, but you're never going to find the end or the way out. The twins start looking around for living people to ask for help and end up stumbling upon the Osaka house, but instead of people there, they find creepy notes about the village, newspaper articles, ghosts, and a ghost fighting camera, the Camera Obscura. With the camera as an owner's manual of sorts explaining that it has the power to exercise ghosts. Mio uses this to fight off the ghost of Miyako, another woman who is spirited away, and then passes out. When she wakes up, Mayu is nowhere to be seen. This starts the wild goose chase for Mayu. When Mayu broke her knee, Mio made a promise to never leave Mayu again, and damn it, she's gonna keep it. They occasionally meet up again, but Mayu always either runs off or just straight up disappears. As the night wears on, Mio becomes more and more aware that the ghosts are trying to force her to participate in the Crimson Sacrifice ritual. They guide her around the village and even refer to her and Mayu as different names as well as say things like The twins that will become the sacrifice have returned. Let's take a break from the plot to talk about what the Crimson Sacrifice ritual actually is. Twins from the village, usually around the age of 15, were chosen every couple of decades to participate in this ritual. The first purpose of the Crimson Sacrifice ritual was to reunite the twins' souls. The villagers thought twins were one soul split in two and if the elder one strangled the younger one, they would be truly connected forever. That's right, strangled. The twins were purified possibly separately in the twin houses and then led to the hellish abyss by the priest where the elder would kill the younger. The red mark formed by their twins' hands on their neck would then become a crimson butterfly while the elder developed the same red butterfly mark, this time as a bruise. The crimson butterflies were then thought to protect over the village kind of like a mini-god. The second and arguably more important purpose, though, was to appease the hellish abyss. The hellish abyss is an unimaginably deep pit in a cave beneath all gods' village connecting our world to the underworld. Every couple of decades, the pit starts acting up and causes earthquakes, poor harvests, and unexplainable deaths eventually leading up to the repentance. We'll come back to what the repentance is in just a second. Let's talk about what caused it first. It was a line of failed rituals, the first being the Tachibana twins, aka Itsuki and Mutsuki. Itsuki, the white-haired boy in the jailhouse, killed Mutsuki in the correct way, but he loved him too much so the ritual failed. I don't really understand how this is a thing, but whatever, it's not the weirdest thing in this series. This is also why his hair is now white. Before their ritual, Itsuki promised Mutsuki that he would keep Yai and Sai from becoming the next twin shrine maidens. He wrote his childhood friend, Ryozo Munakata, asking him to come on the night of the next ceremony so that he could meet Yai and Sai in the woods and take them to safety. Ryozo didn't have enough money to do this on his own, so he asked his folklorist mentor, Seihiro Makabe, to come along with him and help pay for it. You may recognize Seihiro as the man that brought the camera to the village. When they arrived in the village, they were greeted very warmly by the village master, Ryokan Kurosawa, aka Yai and Sai's dad, and they were invited to stay. They did stay, but this was a very bad idea on Seihiro's part because he was held hostage in the Kurosawa house and then used as a kusabi in the hidden ritual. 
A kusabi was an outsider offered to the hellish abyss as a snack, a way of putting off the crimson sacrifice ritual when there were no suitable twins. Although it did not appease the abyss for as long as a successful crimson sacrifice, it did hold it off for at least a little while. After an outsider was welcomed into the village, they would be held hostage in the Kurosawa house. When it was time for the ceremony, they would be escorted down to the rope temple where they would be tied up and suspended in the air. With the ceremony master supervising everything, the priest would then chant while slashing the victim from below at the ends of their staffs. They would continue cutting and stabbing until the kusabi was in as much pain as possible without dying because the abyss only wants living kusabis for some reason. It's a picky eater. Immediately after, the kusabi was brought all the way down through the caverns and lowered slowly into the hellish abyss. Sehiro was a special and very dedicated man and was pretty okay with this, like pretty much as okay as you can be with being a living sacrifice in the pit of hell and his ritual even succeeded, perhaps because of his will to live? Who knows? Before Sehiro was sacrificed though, he wrote Ryozo a letter telling him to leave and come back the night of the ritual. Do not stay here, these people are bad news. Sai and Yai hand-delivered the letter and he promised them he would come back. On the night of the ritual, Itsuki showed Sai and Yai the path out of the village then presumably went off to cause a distraction. Yai was faster and very determined to leave while Sai was panicking, realizing that even if they did escape the village, they could grow apart and die separately anyway. Believing Yai would stop for her, Sai flung herself off the side of a cliff, injuring her leg in the process. A mob of villagers found her and took her back to the village where they waited for Yai to come back. Sadly, she never did. She got lost in the woods and by the time she made her way back, there was nothing left but the Torigate and Misono Hill. Ryozo found her sobbing. Forgive me. Please. Forgive me. Outside of it, without memories, and keeping his promise to Itsuki, he took care of her. After Yai never came back, Sai was forced by her own father to go through the ritual alone. This was unprecedented, but the pit was rumbling so frequently that Ryokan was getting very desperate. The priest hung her from the very last Tori gate closest to the hellish abyss, and then the mourners threw her corpse into it. Since Yai wasn't the one who killed her and the pit is picky, darkness spewed forth filling up the entire village, killing many people in the village on the spot. This also caused all the spirits to become vengeful, including Sai and the Kusabi. This is what the repentance is, it's the disaster that's causing this whole 100 year mess. Anyway, going back to the plot line, at this point it's very clear that Mayu is possessed by Sai. She starts speaking in Sai's voice, transitions into Sai's physical form randomly, and in general just starts acting really weird. Mio starts searching more and more desperately for a way out of the village just so she doesn't have to kill her sister. Mio finds a path out of the village through a tunnel in the Kureha Shrine thanks to Itsuki, but Mayu is kidnapped by a group of villagers and priests before they can get there. At this point, you can either abandon Mayu or go after her. If you decide to leave Mayu, Sai will chase after Mio, eventually touching her, causing Mio to wake up in the forest back at the same spot she was at the beginning of the game with Mayu nowhere to be found. Although it would be nice and convenient to leave Mayu in the Lost Village, canonically Mio follows her sister and finds the path to the hellish abyss where the Crimson Sacrifice ritual took place. Mayu gives her a long speech about how they were born together but they have to live and die separately. She tells Mio that the ritual will make them one again and asks Mio to kill her and Mio does. I think this is because Mio is possessed by the power of the malice coming from the hellish abyss but that's just a personal theory. She could even be possessed by Yai herself, but who knows. Anyway, after Mayu dies, the priests throw her carcass into the abyss and she comes back out a few seconds later as a crimson butterfly and tells Mio, thank you. Mio frantically chases after Mayu in her butterfly form, sobbing and apologizing profusely, but Mayu says nothing else. She just lands on Mio's arm and flies away with the rest of the ghosts and butterflies, presumably up to heaven. Sometime later in the same year, presumably still in the summer before the events of Fatal Frame 3, Mio is back in the Minakami area looking over the large reservoir now covering the lost village due to the recently constructed dam. Mio has a large red-shaped butterfly mark on her throat now due to becoming a remaining. The game ends with a voiceover from Mayu saying, Didn't we always promise each other? Together. Forever. Right off the bat, I want to talk some shit about Mayu. Not only does she drag Mio into all of this, she did it all on purpose. In the hellish abyss ending of the game, the final boss is Mayu possessed by Sai. Here are some quotes from Mayu that are played in the background. I wanted to be with you always. You promised, right? You know, Mio, on that day I fell off the cliff on purpose. I was so afraid they would leave me alone so far away. But I was glad that I had made you mine, but Mio will always be with me. She'll always worry about me. She'll always think about I can't want you to do whatever I say. After this battle, Sai is separated from Mayu but pulls her into the abyss with her. Mio grabs Mayu's hand and against Itsuki's advice, she looks down into the pit and sees thousands of past sacrifices all writhing and fighting to be released. Mio is immediately and permanently blinded and Mayu is quite pleased that Mio now relies on her. In the Frozen Butterfly ending of the remake, we even see a comparison of Sai's maniacal laughter versus Mayu laughing after she fell off the cliff when she was by at the very beginning of the game. In this ending, Mio fights Sai out of Mayu, and then Mayu tries one more time to convince Mio to kill her. When Mio says no, she says, oh, ha, didn't think you would, ha 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 ha. 
Mio flashes back to the accident, and then the next thing we see is Mio lying dead in Mayu's lap. It could be possible that Sai was possessing Mayu the entire time, but at the same time, it seems pretty exhausting. I don't know. I just think Mayu has never been a trustworthy person. She's very suspicious. While these endings aren't canon, I still think they're interesting and viable evidence that Mayu isn't as innocent as she seems. Next, let's talk about some of the major ghosts in the game I haven't gone over yet, beginning with the twins' father, Misa Amakura. Misa is a descendant of Dr. Kunihiko Azo, the inventor of the camera obscura. Dr. Azo went missing around the early to mid-1900s, and possibly from that point on, his entire family line was cursed with bad luck. It's thought that this is the reason Misa took his wife Shizu's last name. Sadly, this did not save him, though, and he went missing in the very same woods that the Lost Village was located in around 10 years before the start of the game. Unfortunately, we most likely never see Misa, but it's still interesting. Next up, Masumi and Miyako, the stars of the Bloody Ring side quest. Masumi Makimura was a land surveyor for the construction of the Minakami Dam. While out on an assignment, he stumbled upon the Lost Village and was trapped. He started frantically researching the history and rituals of the village in an attempt to escape, thus creating the village reports Mio can pick up during Chapter 2. After the search for Masumi was called off only 10 days after he was reported missing, his girlfriend Miyako went looking for him, believing he was still alive. They finally found each other again in the Osaka house, but Miyako's leg was injured and Masumi had more research to do, so he left her there for a little while. At some point, he had read that the Kurosawa family presided over the village's rituals, so he directed his search to their house. While there, he was attacked by the Kusabi in the Great Hall and died in the closet holding a ring he planned to give to Miyako. Unable to accept his death and still longing to give the ring to her, Masumi's ghost returned to the Osaka house where he ended up strangling Miyako instead. In Fatal Frame 3, a note found in Yu's room reveals that the search for Masumi and Miyako has been called off and they are both assumed by locals to be spirited away. The next ghost we're going to talk about is Chitose Tachibana, Itsuki and Mutsuki's younger sister. We don't know her exact age, but she looks to be around 8 years old when the repentance happened. She didn't know anything about the Crimson Sacrifice ritual, so she was understandably very confused when Mutsuki never came home and Itsuki's hair turned white. She had really bad eyesight, so Itsuki gave her a bell to wear around her wrist so he would know if she went somewhere dangerous. Chitose was very close to her brothers, but shy around strangers, and she had a habit of hiding in closets whenever she was scared. Itsuki had given her a key to give to Ryozo, but when Ryozo arrived, she hid in the closet and never gave him the key. This key unlocks the cell Mayu was locked in in Chapter 7, containing documents describing how to get out of the village. After giving Chitose the key, Itsuki was locked up in the storehouse as punishment for helping Sai and Yai escape, leading Chitose to blame Yai for not coming back, thus explaining why she hates Mio so much. After the repentance, she hid inside a cupboard and became trapped. She was ultimately killed by the darkness. Moving on to the more generic ghosts, let's talk about the Veiled Priests and their roles throughout the village. The Veiled Priests were direct aides to the Ceremony Master and represented each of the most important families in the village. Possibly prior to becoming a priest, their bodies were covered in protective writing, mimicking the Japanese story of Hoichi the Earless, in which Hoichi is painted with sacred writing to protect him from the spirits haunting him. Although they played a very small role in the Crimson Sacrifice ritual, just leading the twins to the abyss and tapping their staves rhythmically, they played a much bigger role in the cutting ritual and the hidden ceremony. As I mentioned earlier, they were the ones who tied up the prospective Kusabi and slashed at him from below, then carrying his hopefully still living body down to the abyss and throwing him in. Their other duties included guarding the Kureha Shrine and Kurosawa Family Altar Room to keep twins from escaping and information about the rituals being leaked. They also helped the ceremony master capture potential Kusabis and prepare the mourners. The mourners are the village's criminals and those that have seen the hellish abyss forced to live underground and protect the tunnels. After becoming a mourner, they were never allowed to return to the surface again. As the crimson sacrifice ritual drew closer, the mourners would sew their own eyes shut to prevent seeing into the abyss when they threw the body in. Sometime in between Itsuki and Mutsuki's failed ritual and Sai and Yai's cleansing, the malice from the abyss was so strong that half the mourners were driven insane and jumped in. As ordered by Ryokan, more mourners were made presumably unwillingly from the sinners. Okay, it's time for what you've all been waiting for, the creepiest story of the game, the Kiryu Twins. At only 10 years old, Akane killed her sister, Azami, sacrificing her to the hellish abyss. Their ritual was a success, but Akane became very depressed, so her father, a skilled doll maker, made her a life-size doll of Azami to cheer her up. The doll was so accurate that Akane actually thought it was Azami and even apologized to her. Akane was back to being happy again, but Yoshitatsu became suspicious of the doll. They were inseparable, and Akane was constantly whispering things into the doll's ear. One night, Yoshitatsu heard footsteps in the hallway, at first dismissing it as Akane. As he looked closer, he realized it was the Azami doll. Akane had spent so much time thinking about her sister, it had summoned a spirit to make the doll come to life. Yoshitatsu says in his second note, It is said that when a spirit takes residence in a doll, it can steal the souls of others. Akane isn't a person anymore. She's like a doll. Sometime later, Yoshitatsu had a dream in which the real Azami urged him to destroy the doll because she didn't need to be replaced. She and Akane were already reunited. Even though he knew it would crush Akane, he made plans to destroy the doll by hanging it and throwing it to the hellish abyss. Throughout all of this, the Azami doll was taking advantage of Akane's guilt and weakness and slowly corrupted her mind until Akane was under the spirit's complete control. 
To keep Yoshitatsu from sending her back to hell, she told Akane to destroy the door to the underground passageway by hiding the puzzle's doll parts throughout the house. Yoshitatsu tried desperately to find all the parts, but was killed by Akane before he could. It's unknown how Akane survived without her father, but sometime after, Akane's soul was sucked out by the doll killing her. We also don't know what happened to the doll. Unfortunately, the rest of the ghosts in the game don't really have much of a backstory or connection to the plot, so I won't be getting into them in this video. If you have any questions about them, you can either ask me down below, or you can go to the Zero Wiki. I'll link that below as well. I hope this video is as informative as possible, and if I didn't cover something adequately, or if something is still confusing you, feel free to ask me. I love this series so much and would love to answer your questions or even just discuss the game with you. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Liking helps the YouTube search engine know that this is a good video, and if you subscribe, you'll get to see my explanation of Fatal Frame 3 in the later games as well. Like I said, I plan on making this into a series of informative videos on the game, so there will be plenty more to come. Have a great day, and remember... Yeah.